Okay. Uh, today I get, get back to doing flashlights. And I sort of wandered through them last time. I want to try to make sure I flesh out all the details. Because if you understand how a flashlight works, and flashlight is a very simple electric circuit, if you understand how it works, much of the rest of the discussion of, of electrical equipment, electrical devices, will all make pretty decent sense. And the details, finally, many, many of them don't matter. So with a flashlight, one, one second, having, having just sneezed. <laughs> Huh. With a flashlight, it's, it's a simple circuit con containing a battery or several batteries, a, which are the source electric power. It's got a consumer electric power, which is uh, either a, an old-fashioned incandescent light bulb or, or light-emitting diodes. I'm going to assume it's an incandescent light bulb just because it's a, it's a simpler device to discuss. And some wires and a switch. So that's pretty much all there is to a flashlight. And if you disassemble the flashlight into its pieces and sort of lay them out in, in some sort of structural order, this is essentially what you end up with. A battery, the source of electric power, a light bulb is the consumer of electric power, a switch, in this case it's a big fancy knife switch, some wires, a, a gadget here to show you the, the movement of electric charge. But that's basically the same device, just to uh, expand it. And so my, my, my goal today is to make sure you understand all the pieces and why they do what they do. So the first piece, which is the one that I've got up in the, on the view graph up here, the battery. What's a battery? So a battery is it's an electrochemical device. When you're consuming electric power from it, there is a chemical reaction going on within that, within that, that battery that is carrying electric charge against its natural direction of flow. So electric charge loves to go, electric charge again by, by convention refers to positive charge. Charge likes to go from high voltage to low voltage. When it does that it releases energy and things tend to accelerate in the direction that reduces their total potential energy as quickly as possible. If the main total potential, the main potential energy that an electric charge has is electrostatic that, that's voltage, because uh, voltage is, is the measure of electrostatic potential energy per charge. It, it likes to go from high voltage to low voltage and release the potential energy. So a battery does the, does the reverse. A battery carries charge when it's providing power. It carries charge from low voltage to high voltage. And my, my analogy, and I, now, now I'll try to get the analogies clean and, and pass them along to you. I've got two analogies that work pretty well. One of them is an altitude analogy, and the other one is a water pressure analogy. So the altitude analogy is to think of, of objects. Um, I think in the book I've got skiers, but it can be bowling balls. It can be anything that you lift up. And so you've got a lifting device that carries, say, bowling balls to the top of a hill. Uh, bowling balls don't go up to the hill for free. You've got to carry them. You've got to do work on them, give them energy to to take them from low altitude to high altitude. And they love to go from high altitude to low altitude. You give them an opportunity, they roll downhill. And so the battery in carrying charge from low voltage to high voltage is doing, is analogous to some lifting machine carrying bowling balls from low altitude to high altitude, packing them full of potential energy. For the bowling balls, it's gravitational potential energy. For the electric charges, it's electrostatic potential energy. But the basic idea is the same. Is that OK? So battery, it takes electric charge the way the electric charge does not naturally go. And it does this by consuming chemical potential energy. The, there are, the, the, the chemicals are essentially acting as ferries, carrying the charge to higher voltage, and therefore higher electric, electrostatic potential energy. The details of how the, of how the battery works depends a little bit on the battery. The general idea is these electrochemical processes that do it. The, the chemistry of the battery matters. And the two chemistries that you encounter, uh, it's, it's a, the, the two main ones that you encounter, are the alkaline chemistry, which is associated with the, the, the AA batteries, the AAA batteries, the D batteries that you encounter. Uh, if you still see the 9-volt batteries, which is what I'm using with this microphone, 
the chemistries in these, the alkaline cells, are, are able to move charge from low voltage to high voltage until the voltage rise in the battery, that is the, 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 the lifting process that carries charge from low voltage to high voltage, develops a certain uh, voltage difference between, between its destination, the, the destination for charge and the start. And the alkaline chemistry can carry it across about a one and a half volts. That's all the lifting power that chemistry has. If the voltage difference between those two terminals, the, 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 uh, the starting point and the finishing point, which actually are going to be sort of the negatively charged side and the positively charged side, once the voltage difference there gets to be more than one and a half volts, the chemistry shuts down. It cannot shuttle the charge anymore. It's too much energy per charge, and it, it can't push that hard. So it just it, it's, it gets stuck and, and, and bogs down. The lithium chemistries, and you encounter lithium batteries quite often now, um, that chemistry is a more power, aggressive, powerful chemistry. Lithium is a, uh, I should say, the alkaline chemistry, the main source, the main storage of energy is actually in zinc metal. I, th I think I said that before. Zinc is a fairly reactive metal. That is, it likes to react with oxygen, uh, chlorine, various um, other Things on the right, the rightish side of the periodic chart, but that doesn't, that, that's not, a, not important to know. Uh, lithium is a very reactive metal compared to zinc. It's, 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 it's much more, uh, yeah, much more reactive. It's, it's reactions with things, you throw, you throw it in water and things happen fast. So lithium, the lithium chemistry is able to carry charge, this is where, where I'm heading, it can char carry charge across a bigger difference in voltage. It can actually carry charge through three volts and, and even more than three volts, not, not much more than, I don't know whether you can ever get to four volts, but, but in the vicinity of three to four volts. So the point is that a single alkaline battery can only provide, or alkaline cell, it's called the chemical cell, electrochemical cell, can only carry charge from, from a, a source to a destination where the difference in voltage is about a volt and a half. That is one and a half joules per coulomb. It's how much energy it can give in the pumping process. If you think of the battery as a pump or a lifting device carrying bowling balls, it's like carrying bowling balls. It's like, it's like you've got a lifting device that can carry a bowling ball up one and a half feet and that's all it can do, or one and a half meters, that's all it can do. Uh, the, that's the alkaline chemistry. The lithium chemistry can go three meters or three and a half meters. It's, it's, it's got more oomph to it. Is that okay? Um, the car battery here, I was, it's, it's, it's a third battery that you encounter sort of often. You don't really look under the hood very, very often. Even, even people who used to tinker with their cars don't look under the hood anymore because it's gotten too complicated and computerized and all that stuff. There's, it kind of killed all the fun. <sighs> Technology advanced too much. But anyway, there is, in all likelihood, if you've got a car, there's a, there's a battery like this sitting inside, and it's a lead acid battery, and that's, it's been that way forever. Uh, it is, even those maybe be, if you've got a Prius or something, it's not that anymore either. It's a lithium battery again. But okay, so go back to this guy, this, this lead acid battery. Uh, the main energy storage medium there actually is lead metal. Um, yet another metal around. Um, not one that you want to ingest, but you, you leave it in the battery, and when the, when the battery goes bad, you have it recycled carefully because it's a toxic metal. But anyway, there it is. And the lead acid chemistry can carry charge from, from, from its, where, it, where it's picked up, the source to destination, across about two volts. So it's somewhere in between the uh, alkaline chemistry and the lithium chemistry. And yet the battery, that, that lead acid battery, if you've ever paid much attention to how your car operates, virtually all cars are 12 volts. Uh, they have, that battery is a 12 volt battery and yet it's made, it has, uh, its constituents are two volt cells. How do you do that? Well, actually it's got six of them. It's got six two volt cells in what's known as series. And what series means is that you, that, that any charge passing through one cell subsequently passes through the next cell, passes through the next cell, and the next cell. They, they, they work one after the next in series. I mean, I mean, I guess I'm using the word to define the word, but that's the concept of series as opposed to what? As opposed to parallel, and parallel is another 
uh, common way in which things are arranged in electrical circuits. And parallel means that instead of being having charge move sequentially through them, which is series, it can charge, when charge is allowed to go through one or the other to get to its destination, uh, those, two op those two, the one and the other are in parallel. They're sharing the charge rather than having the charge go through one and then the other. I'll come back to series and parallel, hopefully down the road with this a different demonstration. So the point is, the charge that starts at the negative terminal, the low voltage terminal of the battery, the ba what the battery then does is it, is it carries it, carries that charge up two volts, it lifts it two volts, it lifts it two volts again with a second cell, it lifts it two more volts with a third cell, and fourth and fifth and sixth. By the time it's, the charge has gone through all six cells, one after the next, each one lifting two volts, it's the, the charge has been lifted up a total of 12 volts. Is that okay? Uh, this, sort of, this sort of system where you have the charge goes sequentially through cells is not unique to batteries for cars. It's also present in these flashlights. So this flashlight, I, this is a, an old-fashioned incandescent one, right? It has two D batteries inside. The D batteries, haha, <laughs> prove me wrong, it's got two really El Cheapo batteries in that aren't even alkaline chemistry. These are, these are the ones that you get, the, oh, you're heavy duty. Well, it's, it's, even a, it's still zinc. The energy's in zinc, but this isn't even, it isn't even as, as uh, it's a crummy version of a zinc battery. The point being that it's still one and a half volt battery, but it doesn't store as much energy as an alkaline battery does. So it's a, it's, this, these guys will go dead very quickly. Setting that aside, th these, are, these are essentially the batteries of my childhood, um, which were crummy. Um, you guys have much better batteries around. Uh, point is, there are two of them in there, and the charge goes through them. It, in each case, the, the charge starts at the, the, the low voltage or, or uh, the minus terminal. The, elect, the chemistry carries the charge and puts it on the positive terminal. And it, it will do that until the voltage difference between these two terminals is one and a half volts. If you put two of them together, one after the next, now you've got a structure, and I'll put down the parts, you've got this series arrangement where it can take charge that starts at the negative terminal, the first cell carries it up to the top and develops one and a half volts of increased voltage, increased energy per charge, and the second battery can do it again. And by the time you get to the top, the voltage up here is three volts above the voltage where they started. Is that okay? You put three batteries, you can get, you can get uh, four and a half volts. Four batteries, you get to six volts, and so on. <clears throat> and some flashlights, as they get longer and longer and have more batteries in them, more of these kind of batteries, the voltage gets larger and larger, which is often useful. It means that the charges that are available at the positive terminal have more energy per charge available, more voltage. They can go do more stuff. Every charge can go get more light produced, for example, before it goes back and it picks up more energy. So that's the story of, of those batteries. One, one more thing to talk about with batteries, and I, I have a picture of this stuff in my book. These batteries are, are nine volt batteries. I don't know how often you guys see them anymore. They used to be called transistor batteries because they often ran transistor radios, again, in my youth. But, um, they're still alkaline chemistry. You know, okay, I got in that harangue about the heavy-duty batteries that aren't even as good as alkalines. This is actually consists of, of six little teeny alkaline cells. If you disassemble this, you'll find six little cells inside. They have different geometries. I don't know what the geometry of, of these guys are. But that, that's why they've got a package around them with, ter with terminals on the end. It's because they're trying to hide the six little electrochemical cells that are hiding inside. And all it takes is one of those cells to go bad and lose its ability to carry charge at all, and suddenly the whole battery is so, no longer functional. So that the failures are, these guys fail more easily than the single cells, which all go bad at once. This, this, these guys, have, they're, they're more, there's more vulnerability in here. Uh, the same thing is true of car batteries. Um, 
you know, sort of this public service announcement thing. The car batteries really do have uh, lead metal in there, and as they consume their stored electric chemical uh, energy to, to provide elect electric power, uh, the, the, lead, the lead changes, and I think primarily the lead oxide. And when you run the car, the car has as, as a generating device that recharges the batteries, and I'll come back to, to rechargeable batteries shortly. But one of the key features of a battery that's rechargeable is that as it's consumed, as it's acting as a source of electric power and providing uh, power to run your car, run your light bulb, whatever, the battery, if it's, if it's going to be rechargeable, it, it has to not change structure very much. The, the chemicals can change from, from zinc metal to zinc oxide, for example, or lead metal to lead oxide. They got to stay intact. The whole structure can't change very much. Because when you recharge it, you want to rebuild pretty nearly the battery the way it was. You want to undo the chemical reaction. And if, if the reaction was one that just turned everything into soup and dropped it to the bottom of the battery, you can't undo it because it's physically, the, the battery has is, is physically destroyed itself. And it's, you, you, nobody's going to go in there and, and physically rebuild it. They just want to run it backwards and run the chemistry backwards. And so lead acid batteries, one of the nice things about them is that the, the, the pieces don't change shape when you're consuming electric power. They just change their, exactly what the chemicals are. And then when you run it backwards, they go back to the original chemicals, and the thing is pretty much intact almost perfectly. Um, unless during the, up, the, 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 the consuming power recharging, consuming power recharging, something breaks and parts of the battery fall off. And being made of lead, they typically are heavy and drop to the bottom of the battery. And that, that's the usual failure method for a, for a car battery, is that after you've, you've had it for five years, and you've, whether you've noticed it or not, you've been consuming power from it when you're starting your car, you've been recharging it when you're driving, and consuming, and, and blah, 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 part breaks off, drops to the bottom of the, the, the battery, and you lose one of the cells. There's six of them, after all, right? If you've got one of them, it's just basically nothing. It's an empty space gap. The whole system is broken. You can't, the charge can't work its way from low voltage to high voltage anymore. It's got a bad spot in the middle, and your battery's dead. You have to replace it. Is that OK? Uh, alkaline batteries, pretty much not rechargeable. Why? Because the source of electric power is it's typically zinc, but it's not zinc chunk, it's zinc powder. And when you consume it, the powder gets ruined. And when you try to rebuild the powder, you can't rebuild, it doesn't get rebuilt as a powder. It rebuilds crummy shape, the shape's all bad. And so you can't recharge alkaline, the alkaline chemistry, you can't undo the, the consumption process easily. I'll come back to recharging shortly, but, but that's, basic idea. Lithium batteries, you can. They work very hard at making rechargeable lithium batteries. Those are, you're, you guys are all used to having rechargeable lithium batteries and don't even think about it. Um, they would be, have been completely astonishing to people in the, in the 60s and 70s. Oh my gosh, they store that much energy and they're rechargeable hundreds of times without all this fussing and dealing with details. Um, you, you don't know how good you got it. You know, <laughs> anyway, I would say you don't deserve it, but no, you deserve it. All right. So last couple of details here. The chemistry determines the voltage difference between the, between the negative terminal battery and the positive terminal battery. That, that's how much the, the charge is lifted up in voltage. Um, the, all the alkaline batteries, that is the triple A's, the double A's, and the D batteries, they're all one and a half volt batteries. So if you, what does that mean? That means that these are, this is a D battery. Do I have a, I got a triple A's in my, in my laser pointer here. Yep. You know, so even though it's not officially an alkaline battery, I mean, it, okay, I get the purest in me goes, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm lying here for pedagogical reasons. But, but they're almost identical chemistries. Anyway, they're both one and a half volt batteries. What's the difference then between these two? 
The difference is how much energy they store. This one, in principle, stores a whole lot more energy. It's got more chemicals in it than this one. So if you, if you try to consume uh, energy from it, you'll get, I don't know how many joules you'll get out of this. You'll get three times that many, or five times that many joules of energy out of this one. It's just got more chemicals around to store it. The other thing is if you try to consume the, the energy quickly, which is to say you're trying to, to draw a large amount of power out of it, because remember power is energy per time, this one can deliver more power. It can simply, yes, they're both one and a half volts, but if you try to take out a joule per second out of each of these guys, this one will be, this can probably pull it off. This guy for, certainly can put, pull it off. It's just got more, more surface areas in there. It's, it's able to move more charge faster. Is that okay? So in principle, if you're desperate for, you run out of D batteries and you just you absolutely need to have 30 seconds of light from your flashlight or something like that, you can put little AA batteries in there if you can get the pieces to touch properly. It'll work. It's the same voltage. It just can't deliver as much power or for as long before it runs out of juice. All right. Any questions about batteries? In general, anything but batteries. I will come back to recharging, but, but otherwise, this, so this is the source of electric power for our story. Uh, I think I've got, um, just uh, to, to make sure I finished with the two analogies, the lifting, lifting skiers I've got in the story, but, or lifting bowling balls, whatever it is. So, so the, uh, the 12 volt battery is equivalent to, it's, it's six cells, each one lifts a certain distance, so I can lift the bowling balls, let's say 12 meters, if I'm gonna like make meters equivalent to volts. So up it goes. Uh, the other analogy I wanted to introduce and, and just pass along, just, just for you to use to try to understand what the heck is going on, is, is water and pressure. Uh, water under pressure has, has added energy with it. It's the, the, the name for that energy, I call it pressure potential energy. It's a little bit of a, it, it, as people who've taken 1050 will know, it, it's, it, it's not literally stored in the water. The, the pressurized water has extra energy in it, but it's not literally in the water. It's in the promise of a pump to replace that, 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 that water if you, if you use it. So if you consume pressurized water, the pump replaces it by, by adding energy to, to ordinary water. And in any case, the point is that pressurized water has energy that, that it can do things with it, that, that low pressure water can't. And so a pump can move, moves water from low pressure to high pressure. And if you uh, want to move, yeah, the higher the pressure that it provides, the more energy that water has per liter, per, 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 per portion of water. I often call it the energy per drop. If you want to add more energy, use, you have to use multiple pumps. And here, just as a in public service announcement piece too, um, I, I often have a, one or two or three firefighters in this, in this class. And over the years, I had quite a number of them. And they know that when, when you go in and try to fight a fire, there are often occasions when you're trying to move water to places you can't get to easily. They're either great height or great volumes. I mean, you're, just, you, you're trying to get the water to, to, to go places. So if you simply take the water at the pressure that's provided by the, by the county water or city water uh, main, that's not enough often to fight a fire at great height. Not enough energy per drop. What do you do? You send it through a pumper truck. So the trucks show up, they have pumps in them, run on engines, the, 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 the vehicle engine is, probably is, is associated with, with running the pump. And that, sending the water through one, one pumper can get adds enough energy per drop. drop. It's, it's like running through a battery. It takes the water in at one, at one uh, pressure and delivers it at a higher pressure. Just like a battery takes electric charge in at one voltage and delivers it at higher voltage. And if you gotta go fight a fire at greater height, what do you do? You actually run the water, and they do this, they run the water through more than one truck and more than one pump. So the water goes into one, one truck through, out, comes out at high pressure out, out of out of that truck's pump, and it goes into a second truck, and a second truck's pump, and is pumped, is pumped again to, to yet higher pressure. So they play the same games of series circuitry, 
that a battery, that a, that a, like a car battery does. You, want, you need 12 volts, fine. Go through six two-volt cells. You need, to hit, you need to fight a fire on the 83rd floor, fine. Go through six pumper trucks. Water, building the pressure up each time. Is that okay? So hopefully these will be somewhat useful to you as, as analogies for, for, for voltage and circuits. Okay, so the other half of the, the, other, the key, key player in a circuit is the light bulb. And the light bulb is a, it's effectively a wire, but it, it, um, it's a wire that highlights the an important characteristic of all ordinary conducting device, conducting materials, and that is that they don't conduct electric, electricity perfectly or for free. Uh, making electric charge move through, move through them costs energy. Um, just to, to, to make sure I fleshed out the story that's going on here, when I close this switch, the light bulb lights up. And, and I'll remind you what, what's going on here, and I can turn on this little gadget so you can, in principle, see the flow of electric charge, and I can zoom in so, so if you can't see directly, you can see on the screen. And what's happening is the battery, we, we have to start somewhere in what's called a circuit, the circuit being a continuous loop. Let's start here at the negative terminal of the battery, the low voltage terminal. The battery does what I just described in the past 20 minutes. You know, it, it takes charge from the negative terminal, chemically lifts it to 2 volts higher, 4 volts higher, 6 volts higher, 8, 10, 12 volts higher. And when the charge arrives here at the positive terminal of the battery, it's got it's, it's at a 12 volt increase in voltage. So the battery is providing, just again to build language, it's providing a 12 volt voltage rise for the electric charge passing through this system. Uh, and I'll remind you also that electric charge on the move. When electric charge is flowing and going somewhere, we describe it as a current, an electric current if you want to be more picky, as opposed to a water current. But it's a current of electric charges. And the battery provides an electric current with an increase in voltage, a voltage rise, in this case, 12 volts. Questions about that idea? Okay. So the charge can leave, or well, it's available here if you want to get it. It's available here at 12 volts higher than it, than it, than it started. And if there's nowhere to go, it just sits there. And the chemistry stops doing anything interesting. The charge is there. The chemistry can't move any more charge because if it did, the voltage would get, the voltage would increase beyond 12 volts, and the chemistry itself can't handle that. So the chemistry shuts down. If I do give it away to go somewhere by, by attaching this wire, poof, the charge now starts to go through the wire. It goes through the switch, which is, which is closed. The the the, the jargon word for, for the current situation is closed as opposed to open. So that's an open switch, that's a closed switch. Do I care whether you remember those words or if they mean anything, you know, who cares? It's, the idea is that it's now a continuous piece of metal from there all the way through the switch to the light bulb. At the light bulb, the charge is arriving there with lots of energy per charge. So there's a voltage, there's a voltage anywhere you like, but the voltage right here at the entrance to the light bulb is almost, but not quite, 12 volts. It's a little less. And we'll come back in a little while to why it's a little less. But so the charge is there at essentially 12 volts. And it goes through the light bulb. And when it leaves the light bulb, it's basically lost all of its energy per charge. That's what made the light bulb light up. The energy per charge was being consumed by the light bulb. And it leaves the light bulb at approximately 0 volts. It's actually a little above 0 volts. Again, we'll come back to that in a minute. But there was a voltage drop in the light bulb between where the current entered and where the current left. And that voltage drop is about 12 volts. It's just under 12 volts. So pretty much all the energy that was added to the passing current, the passing charge in the battery, is dropped off in the light bulb, which makes it white hot, and, or you know, yellow white hot, and, and is making it send out light and heat into the room. And the charge then continues 
you know, here's the little, the little gadget showing you it's continuing. Can you see that? Sort of. And it goes back to the battery's minus terminal uh, and picks up more energy in the battery and does the circuit again. And pretty much, you know, all, not every circuit, not, sorry, not all power delivery involves a circuit, but pretty nearly all of it does. The, the circuits, the power delivery that doesn't involve a circuit is, 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 a whole, is, an, is another detailed story that's not important at the moment at all. The main thing is, is that sy systems like this, flashlight type circuits, most circuits you ever encounter, most electrical devices you ever encounter involve circuits. And the circuit is a circuit. The, the charge arrives carrying a, a large amount of energy per charge, and the current goes, drops off the energy per charge and then returns to pick up more energy per charge. And it goes around and around. I said last time that, that you, you rarely or never want to have charge come to you and stop and, and keep it. You don't want to hold on to the charge. It's, what are you going to do with it? it uh, it's going to cause you trouble having that charge accumulate. You're going to start attracting or repelling things. So you send it back to get more energy. And that's the circuit idea. Energy comes through one wire, and energy, energy arrives in the moving charge coming through one wire, the current coming through one wire, same, the same concept. Current is the moving, moving charge. And it goes back, the, the current goes back to pick up more electric energy um, through their wire. Where I'm getting hung up in my own head about, about words is, the, is distinctions like using the word current. So, I'm, so I'm, hopefully we'll get you all more comfortable with it. Um, I'm getting not enough feedback to know whether you're comfortable with the word current. But cur current is, is charge on the move, and you can watch how much goes by per second. You okay with that? Can I feel comfortable using the word current? Uh, it's measured, as, as I said last time, in, in standard units. The standard unit is, is, is the classic unit of charge, which is the Coulomb, and the classic unit of time, which is the second. So coulombs per second is the way you, most people measure current. And the coulomb per second has its own name. It's called the ampere, or amp. So if you, whenever you encounter amps, this is what you're talking about, how many charges are going by per second. So the current going through here is, is we can measure an amp. The other piece of language that I'm struggling with to, to, in my own head to try to convey to you is the distinction between energy and power. The power is energy per unit of time as opposed to just energy. And to, to make sure I've, I've conveyed the, you know, use one of my analogies to get that along. Remember I talked long ago about energy because it's a conserved quantity, you can sort of think of it as, oh, well, it's analogous to money. You've got a certain amount of money, unless you burn it, you know, you've got that amount of money. Unless somebody gives you money, you can't have more. If you're law abiding, you, you, the amount of money you've got is fixed. So you can give $100 to somebody else, and that's like giving energy to somebody else. This, the analogy is there. Uh, where does power fit into this? Power is the movement of energy over t per time. So it's like salary. So you, if you've got a salary of, let's be optimistic, $1,000 an hour, really optimistic. $1,000 an hour, that means that every hour, a thousand units of this stuff, of dollars, come flowing into your coffers. That is like power. It's like energy per time. That's dollars per time. So, so power is, is, a, is typically a steady uh, flow of energy from one place to another. So, so actually, to, just to, to pin this down then, this circuit right now is moving about according to the light bulb here, 80 watts of power from the battery to the bulb. How is that happening? That means so that's 80 joules every second is going from the battery to the bulb. How is it happening? It's happening because every charge that, that moves from the, whenever a charge moves from the negative terminal to the positive terminal of the battery, it, it picks up 12, 12 volts, which is 12 joules per coulomb. So every coulomb that moves from, from the black terminal to the red terminal, acquires 12 joules of energy in going through the, through the battery, sucked out of the chemical potential energy of the battery. And when it works its way through the wires and, and passes through the light bulb, it drops off that same 12 joules per coulomb. So in order to, to drop off 
80 joules every second, you need a, a fair number, a fair amount of charge moving through here because every Coulomb drops off 12 joules, but you gotta get to 80 of those joules every second. So you need about seven Coulombs going through the circuit every second. So there's about seven Coulombs of charge moving through the battery and, and experiencing a voltage rise of 12 volts, and then going through the, through the light bulb and experiencing a voltage drop of 12 volts. Seven Coulombs per second is, is seven amperes. So the current flowing through the circuit right now is about seven amperes. Ideally, we, I'd come up with a nice even number. It's seven amperes of, of if, if, if uh, the current is going through a voltage drop of 12 volts here in the light bulb, and seven amperes are flowing at seven times 12 is 84 watts, 84 joules per second. So you know, it's, it's about seven amperes, but a little less maybe. Is that okay? Questions about that idea? I'm starting to get dazzled by the bulb. So I'll turn the gadgets off and come back to so it. All right, uh, camera. Do I want to? Oh, I, you know, I, I, won't, I won't ask this question. I'll just tell you the answer to this question. It's, it, this brings up a topic that I, well, I, I have talked about it before, but I, I can ask it. In a flashlight, power is transferred from the batteries to the light bulb, whether it's a real flashlight or this exploded version, this expanded. Why can't power go the other way? I mean, no, in principle, no energy left the room when I turned this on. The energy started in the battery, and now it's rattling around the room in, in the light and the thermal energy coming off the light bulb, which is hot. But if, if we sealed the doors and insulated the whole room, the energy's still here. So we've gone from energy to energy. It's still around. Nothing much happened. Why doesn't this whole thing happen backwards then? Why is, it, why is it always going from the batteries discharging and the light bulbs glowing? Why doesn't it run backwards, in other words? Is that okay? Question okay? Or you, you understand what the question is? Um, it's, you know, so how many think that the reason for this one-way character is that power can only flow forward in the flashlight? Nope, okay. How about the light bulb consumes electric, power, electric charges too? They're gone. Nope. Okay. Um, how about the disordered energy can't become ordered energy? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I won't even ask the third one. Um, the fourth one, it's, you know, ugh, we're not a good, good, bad, good, wrong answers. It's, it's, a, it's one way because of statistics. There, the energy really is still in this room. I mean, assuming it didn't rattle out through reflections out, out, out into the hall. But you can't undo the creation of thermal energy very easily for statistical reasons. This, is, I, this goes back to me stirring the beads in the dish and stuff. It's just statistically too unlikely for all that energy to get back together, re, re -emer, uh, reorganize itself, go into the light bulb filament, add energy to charges, move them against their will from low voltage to high voltage, and then recharge the battery. It just doesn't happen. It's statistically so unlikely, completely not going to happen. All right, so it's a one-way arrangement for that reason. Um, so how, I, I've talked about this already, the, the movement of, of electric charge uh, being called current. Where, where I think I want to go instead, of, rather than try to hunt through my slides for, for what I want to say here, is that the, the reason that the light bulb consumes electric power as current flows through it is because it highlights the fact, it's, 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 a, it's a particularly strong example of the fact that the electric charge does not move for, for free through ordinary conductors, which is pretty nearly everything you ever encounter. I told you that metals are distinguishable from insulators in that charge is mobile in metals. Insulators, if you put a, 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 blo a blob of, of electric charge at one end of a piece of plastic, the charge is pretty much going to sit there. It's going to have a tough time moving anywhere else. And certainly going through the plastic is very, is very unlikely. There's just no mobile charges inside. No charges that can move uh, macroscopic distances, distances you can measure with your, with your eyes or with your fingers. 
In metals, that's not true. Charges are mobile in metals. They can go long distances. So that if you touch, put charge on one side of a piece of metal, a pot, the charge will very quickly mo move around the metal and be, be, a, be obtainable, for example, on the far side of the piece of metal. So that's true. However, although metals can let charge move, they, 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 there's a cost to the charge moving. The charge loses energy moving through the metal. It's essentially a, it's, it's a friction-like effect. Whatever way the charge tries to move through metal, it loses a little bit of energy en route. And to make it move through the metal and keep moving through the metal, you have to push it. So for charge to move through even these wires, you have to push it. Well, what pushes charge? Electric fields. Remember electric fields? You need an electric field to push charge. And charge, being positive by, by convention, moves in the direction of the electric field. So to make charge move through this wire and this wire, and the light bulb filament and the other wires, there has to be an electric field pointing in the direction the charge should move. How strong does that electric field have to be? Depends on the, on the specific metal or, or, con, or conducting path that it's moving through. In these wires, even a little, it all takes a little electric field, just a little, but it's got to be there. If it's not there, the charge will slow to a stop by, by sort of rubbing effects. And those rubbing effects will, will take out the, elect, the, the, the moving charges, the currents, uh, energy, and turn it into thermal energy. So these wires will get a little hot. And uh, to keep them moving forward, you need a little electric field. How do you get an electric field? You get it by having a voltage drop in the wire. The voltage here, I told you, is 12 volts because that's what the battery provided. The voltage here isn't 12 volts anymore, when, not now. Uh, to get the charges, we've got seven amperes of current flowing through this wire. To keep that current moving through the wire, you've got to push it. It needs an, a forward electric field, a pushing electric field. So the voltage is decreasing in this wire a little bit. It starts at 12 volts, and by the time you get over here, that, that, that might be 11.9. Uh, you might lose one-tenth of a volt in going through that wire. And that difference in voltage, remember, creates a voltage gradient. Remember voltage gradients? Voltage gradients are electric fields. So that drop in voltage creates the electric field that is required to push the current through the wire. All right? It, the analogy to say water flowing and water pressure is the same thing. You want to make water flow through a pipe? You got to push it. It doesn't go through the pipe for free because of friction-like effects, too. So you want to deliver water to your tree house or, you know, or your, 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 the cabin in the woods a mile from your house, if you put ordinary household water pressure into that pipe and hope that the water will make it all the way to your, to your cabin in the woods at full pressure, full energy per drop, nah, -uh, it's not going to do that. You have to boost the pressure. It's going to be, it needs to be pushed all the way and it's got to be pushed by a gradient in pressure. And here, it's a gradient in voltage that's doing the pushing. All right? So this is maybe 11.9 volts. Goes through the switch, 11.8 volts. Gets to the light bulb, 11.7 volts. Goes into the light bulb filament. That light bulb filament is very thin. Um, it's designed to be a terrible conductor of electricity. And, and a, a material that has a poor ability to conduct electricity has a large electrical resistance. That's the, 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 the classic way of characterizing a conducting path's ability or inability to carry current well is called electric resistance, how much it fights the flow of current. This has got the, by far the biggest resistance in this story. As a result, making 70 amperes of current flow through that light bulb filament takes a very large electric field. It's, it's hard to get that current to go through there. And therefore, you have to push hard. The, you need a very large voltage difference between entry and exit, big voltage drop. So the voltage goes from almost 12 volts to almost zero volts in the filament to keep the current flowing through, I mean, when I, when I connect it, OK? So the current is, is struggling to get through that, that filament um, it's, it's, 
it's rubbing and dragging terribly and getting very hot as a result. The, energy, the, electric, the charges leaving have almost no, no energy left. They have just enough to carry them through the last wires. Remember, they still, you, still need a, you still need an electric field to push the charges back to the battery, so you need a little bit of voltage drop left to get the charges back to the battery. So when this is all operating, it's like to, to, to go back to, to one of the analogies, the lifting up and then letting, lifting bowling balls up and letting them go. This lifts the bowling balls up. It lifts them up 12 units, 12 meters if you like. They then roll a little downhill through the first wire because the wire won't take them for free. You gotta, care, you gotta push. They'll go through the, the switch, through this wire. They're getting a, they're, the bowling balls are coming down a little bit, just as the current is coming down a little bit in voltage. Going through that filament, tremendous loss of energy per charge, which is equivalent to just letting the bowling ball plummet almost to, to, the, to the floor. And that energy is released in, in, the, in the descent of those bowling balls. They're coming down through, I don't know, bouncing and rubbing against everything, struggling to get down, just as the charges are struggling to get through the light bulb filament. They come out, in the, in the, in the real story, they come out at almost zero volts, in my analogy to bowling balls, they come out at almost floor level, not quite little, they're a little above floor level because they still got to go back to the lifting device, which the battery equivalent. They got to roll a little bit downhill to get to, to the lifting device, which then lifts them up and lets the whole story go again. So round and round they go like that. And that's really how the circuit, a, a flashlight circuit works. Questions about any of that? Well, let me stop this. What I wanted to show you, a couple things. I, I, I did promise that I would say two cents at least about, about batteries and recharging them. A battery in this story over here is entirely a source of electric power, meaning that it takes charge in at low voltage, uses its chemicals to move the charge to high voltage and lets it go running through the circuit to do interesting things. What happens if you shove electric current backwards through the battery? Well, first of all, is that even possible? And the answer is yes. If you take this, this battery here and you deliberately start pushing positive charges from somewhere outside, you put positive charges on that terminal, you just pile them up. Well, the voltage of that terminal will, go, will get larger and larger and larger because the more you pack positive charges on there, a process that involves doing work, you're shoving them on against their will, after all, the, the higher the voltage goes. Eventually, the voltage gets large enough over here that the charges, they want to leave. The only, place they can, the only way they can leave is by going through the chemistry of the battery to the negative terminal. And they can do that. And if they do that, and they basically run the chemistry backwards, the little, the little chemical fairies, and I'm not thinking like fairies like with, butter, with wings. I'm thinking like, 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 like boat fairies and stuff. The little chemical fairies that are moving charge in here, you can run them backwards. And if you run them backwards, you undo the chemical reaction that, was, that, that, that provided electric power to rebuild the chemicals. And if the physical structure of the battery can, can tolerate this, the battery will recharge. So when you are recharging batteries, you do that by making one of the batteries, or, the, or one of the cells, or all the cells, you make them consumers of electric power. Instead of having them carry charge from low voltage to high voltage and send it on its way, you force them to take volt charge in at high voltage, go through them backwards, and, and leave at low voltage with less energy. They dropped off energy. Where did it go? It went into the chemistry of the battery. So that's the recharging process. So when you plug your phone into the recharger or something like that, you are taking its, its batteries, which now these days are essentially always lithium batteries. You are running the battery backwards. The very sophisticated stuff is going on inside your, your, your phone. It's, it's sort of amazing that this, this is, you, you have to pay no attention at all to this. It's so easy. Years ago, recharging batteries was very, was fraught with perils, fraught with ways in which you could destroy your batteries. So now you, you, you run the chemistry backwards, you make the batteries temporarily consumers of electric power, they rebuild the chemicals, and they store the energy. Not all the energy goes into the rebuilding chemicals. Some goes into thermal energy. So when you recharge your phone, it, it typically will get a little warm. That is, that's the, 
the energy that failed to go into the, chemi into the chemistry and instead became thermal energy in, in, in the um, batteries. Um, it's pretty much all under control. I mean, occasionally, you're, you're, the charging will stop maybe on a hot day when you've got your car in the car. You've got your phone in the car and it's overheating. It'll say, uh, charging pause because your battery's too hot or something like that. Um, it's, it's protecting you against one of the many ways in which recharging could, could disaster, cause disaster. Anyway, that's, that's uh, most of flashlights. I've got a few more things I'll show you next time.